When you compare the worship space of the average Catholic church with the worship space of the average Protestant church, something obvious becomes apparent. See if you can spot the difference. Here's a Catholic church and a Protestant church. A Catholic church and a Protestant church. Here's a Catholic church next to a Protestant church. The Catholic church is the one on the left. Needless to say, we Catholics like to engage our senses. Our churches are adorned with vivid images, surrounded by lifelike statues, and bathed in colorful light. For us, the grander the better. Unfortunately, it's because of this that a common attack has been levied against us by some of our Protestant brothers and sisters in Christ. We are nothing but idolaters that worship the saints and bow before idols, even removing the second commandment to fit our heresy. Which is a pretty serious claim that we need to address. Is there something wrong with the way we worship? And what did we do with the second commandment? This is Catholicism in Focus. To start off, let's dive right into the question of the Ten Commandments because it's truly a fascinating issue. As I discussed in a previous video, the whole idea of numbering the commandments is a controversial topic because, well, the Bible's complicated. In Exodus 20, the first instance in which they are listed, there are no numbers attached to any of the statements, and strictly speaking, there's actually 13 different commands in the section. It's not until centuries later, used as a teaching tool, that Christians and Jews actually separated them out as individually numbered commandments, and there were, of course, discrepancies. Most Protestants and Jews decided to split verses 2 through 6 up into two commandments, not having any other gods but me, and not making graven images, while Catholics kept this all together as one commandment. On the flip side, Protestants and Jews take verse 17 about coveting a neighbor's house, wife, and possessions as one commandment, while Catholics separate them into two. Because, you know, we just feel like there's kind of a difference between coveting a neighbor's possession and coveting his wife. Because, you know, women aren't property. But hey, that's just us. Others feel that it's much less important than making a distinction between having no other gods besides me and having no idols but we just sort of see that as the same commandment. Regardless, Catholics have not removed any commandment of God. The fact that our commandment number two is different from others isn't because we've ignored a prohibition from God. It's because we feel that verses two through seven are essentially the same command. There is only one God, so do not worship anything or anyone else. Okay, you say, but what about all the idols and images you do have in church? If you claim to hold that commandment, why don't you follow it? A few things. First, let's not confuse God's command not to have graven images of other gods with a law forbidding images in general. By grouping all verses 2 through 7 together in one command, Catholics understand that what God means by images refers specifically to him and other gods. It's a question of fidelity, not of austerity in art. This is seen clearly when we turn just a few chapters later and see that God, in fact, prescribes the use of images in worship. In Exodus 25, the law reads, You shall then make a cover of pure gold, two and a half cubits long and one and a half cubits wide. Make two cherubim of beaten gold for the two ends of the cover. Make one cherub at one end and the other at the other end of one piece with the cover at each end. The cherubim shall have their wings spread out above, sheltering the cover with them. They shall face each other with their faces looking toward the cover. In the case of the tabernacle in Exodus, as well as in the instructions for the temple later on, God gives specific commands to include images, fine gold, ornaments, color, and all lavish decorations depicting a heavenly realm. So, no, there is no law forbidding the use of images in general. In fact, they're required. But you Catholics don't just have images of angels. You worship images of the saints and statues of Mary. These are idols that you place in your church. There is no doubt that we give a lot of attention to art and statues in our worship spaces, taking care to adorn them with great care. For an outsider, this may appear as if we are worshiping the images themselves or distracting our prayer away from God. This, however, is simply not true. What people have to understand is that we take our relationship with the communion of saints very seriously. We know from Scripture, particularly the book of Revelation, that the just worship in heaven at the banquet feast of the Lamb. 
Those who have been redeemed and sanctified enjoy God's presence for eternity. These saints are human beings, men and women who once lived here on earth just like us, needing God's grace just like us. And yet, they lived extraordinary lives. In this way, we place images and statues of the saints as a memorial of inspirational figures. Just as stadiums and monuments commemorate the greatest among us, our works of art remind us of those faithful Christians who followed God while they lived, who inspire us to be as dependent on God as they were. But it's more than that. Because we know that they live now in heaven and not just in our memory, we know that their prayers are joined with ours whenever we worship God. Just as we come together among the living, just as we ask our friends and family to pray for us in times of need, so too do the saints take part. They are with us in our worship of God and they are able to pray for us in our times of need. It's not as if we go to the saints in place of God. We do not treat them as if they are God. No, we go to them as friends to offer us direction and companionship as we go to God together. But you cannot deny the idolatry of adoration. You bow, kneel, and worship a piece of bread surrounded by a gold sun. Despite popular misconceptions, Catholics do not worship a piece of bread, the sun, or any object. The only object of our worship, ever, is the living and true triune God. You see, until the Protestant Reformation, all Christians believed that in the celebration of the Lord's Supper, what we call Mass, the elements of bread and wine were transformed into the real presence of Christ body, blood, soul, and divinity. This was the belief of Christians in the first centuries of the church, and it's something that the Catholic and Orthodox churches have maintained ever since. If you're a part of a Christian tradition that departs from this ancient teaching, this might be difficult to understand. But what Catholics worship is not a piece of bread or special gold. What we are worshiping in the Eucharist is the very presence of God. It's not an image or idol. It is God himself. So, no. We do not worship idols. We do not worship anything or anyone except God. And isn't that something that all Christians should want to hear? As easy as it is to look at what Catholics do from the outside and conclude for yourself that we're idolaters, separate from real Christians, it's simply not true. And that should be good news. We agree that God is the only true object of worship. We may have different ways to express that. You may personally find our adornments a bit distracting, and we may find your churches a bit desolate. But that doesn't mean that we're worshiping different gods or disobeying God's rule. There is something, I'm sure, that we can learn from one another. But not, as I suspect is often the case, if you're looking for an enemy. Our style of worship may be different from yours, but we are not your enemy.